MPA in psychology and a master's of education. She was a mental health schools counselor for 12 years before entering YSN, a member of Phi Beta Kappa, Phi Kappa Phi, Golden Key National Society, and Sigma Theta Tau. She is the recipient of numerous awards for academic excellence. Amanda will graduate in just a few weeks as a psychiatric nurse practitioner. Amanda.
indeed, I thought to myself, all of this might be easier for you if he hadn't always been so amiably uncomplicated, if you were somehow a bad mother. Not easier maybe, but less shocking, or more like a culmination you could have at least retrospectively seen coming. I noticed your eyes tracking the unshaven man shuffling by in his laceless sneakers and ill-fitting clothes. I understood your wordless entreaty for me to see the difference between your son and this other patient. It would not have helped for me to say that Henry used to teach English at a local community college, that his life had also taken an unexpected turn, that there are reasons no one is allowed a razor or shoelaces here. You were not ready for that. Jesse was always very creative and fearless. That's what made him so good at the high jump. Somehow, this non sequitur pulled you back together and explained everything. He climbed every tree in our yard as high as he could go, sometimes with my red apron flapping on his back. He called it his crusader cape, which always made us laugh. We never knew where he learned that word, crusader. His magic marker letter J is still there, no matter how many times I've washed it. I was forever telling him not to climb with that cape, worried he would strangle. You clapped your hand over your mouth, the echo of danger still in the air, an ex post facto warning. You looked panicked, suddenly redefining Jesse's childhood innocence with shades of new significance. I mean, you began. It's okay, I interrupted. I know. You needed so much for me to understand, to normalize what I could not. It must be hard to see him this way, I said, immediately hating myself for resorting to such a textbook response at a time like this, and yet not knowing what else to say, what else you might be able to hear. Your husband, silent until now, put his hand on your shoulder. Honey, you know this is different. He's talking about going to the White House and letting people write words of protest on his naked body. He's saying all kinds of crazy things. Your husband looked guilty, quickly apologizing for using the word crazy. You looked defeated. Your tears spilled over, your voice just above a whisper. But what did we do wrong, you continued, voice stronger. A question in which I really thought you meant to say, please tell us what we have to do to make this right. Because of course no one wants blame really, just control. And what mother wouldn't want to tighten the reins, even in the best of times to tether young Icarus to the ground so that his falls would result only in a scraped knee or two, so that his flight would not end in flame. You had only just learned how to let go, only just sent him away to college. And I saw how you looked at your husband, as if to say, see, this is what can happen. He's a good boy, you said again. Your apparent talisman against emotional chaos of loss, your recipe for his success. I thought I understood then just how much was at stake for you, how precarious your sense of order, your illusion of control. Somewhere in the space between hope and despair, agency lives. We work hard to be good enough to cheat the time-worn truth that bad things happen, even to the best of us. Our magical thinking stops short of donning capes, of believing we can fly, but sometimes only by the smallest margin. Who among us doesn't try for paint-by-numbers calculability when it really matters? Who hasn't counted on ritualized crossed fingers? 
but I didn't know how to put that into words for you then. So instead I said, he is a good boy, and I hoped for all of us that being good would matter.